Marie and I spent some time with Mary Williams today talking about her recent experience at the ASPB meeting in Hawaii. ASPB always holds a annual meeting uh, that's rather large, and we wanted to talk with Mary about her tips and tricks for making the most out of going to a large conference, which is definitely a really different experience than going to smaller conferences, which um, students or postdocs generally uh, go to. So we talked about how to choose what kind of conferences to attend if you have the opportunity, how to prepare for those conferences, how to make the most out of attending these conferences, whether it be how to meet people at poster sessions or how to talk to people in line while you're waiting for coffee. And Mary had a lot of really interesting things to say about really utilizing that time to make the most out of your own experience there. Um, and not just not just with the, the talks that you're going to go to, but the people that you'll meet and uh, the other opportunities that you have as an undergrad, as a postgraduate, and also as a postdoc. It was really, really a wonderful conversation that Marie and I had with, with Mary. Um, so please, please enjoy, and I hope that you learned something from, from our conversation. Okay, so Mary, you went to the ASPB meeting, which is the American Society of Plant Biologists meeting. Um, which is a relatively large conference for plant, the plant community, plant science community. And it was in Hawaii, which sounds terrible. <laughs> Especially coming from Glasgow. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was interested in kind of getting your, uh, your impression on how the conference went, um, kind of in general this year, but also to kind of talk about as a large, as a large conference, what are the kind of do's and don'ts of of a large conference and how can we most optimize our time at a conference you know, either as just a kind of casual visitor or someone who's presenting or a student for example. Right. Yes, um, Hawaii is not a terrible place to go. <laughs> and just about everyone I spoke to either tagged on a holiday at the beginning or the end of it. and. Um, and it was lovely. Um, the hotel I stayed in was right on the beach, and so every morning I went for a swim in the ocean, and the water was Aww. ridiculously warm. So, oh, poor me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A real personal problem. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it was a good conference. Um, I've been going to the Plant Biology Conference more or less continuously for... Um, almost 20 years, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I started going to this particular conference. Uh, the first one I went to was when I was a postdoc, and I was amazed by the diversity of topics. And that's one of the reasons I continue to go, because before that I'd been going to small meetings, and it was great because for my little field of transcriptional regulation and developmental biology, it was nice to get to know everybody in the field, and that's the brilliant thing about small conferences. But particularly when I started teaching, I found that the, the broader conference that spans really the breadth of plant biology, um, or at least plant sort of <clears throat> biochemistry, cell biology, uh, was very rewarding. And I remember I used to force myself to go to sessions where I didn't know anything about the topic. And uh, I won't mention any particular topics, but I would sit there and just the first slide I was fine, the second slide I sort of got, the third slide I was lost, <laughs> but I just kept doing it and it, it's made a big difference in my grasp of the, the breadth of plant biology. So for me that's one of the big strengths of the big conference is it gets me outside of my comfort zone yeah. in terms of the science. Yeah. And that's certainly something that any field that could be applied to. Exactly. Exactly. The small conferences are fantastic and specialized, and you don't necessarily expand your horizons. Mm -hmm. You get more depth, but not really more breadth. Um, so the downside of the big conference, um, and I think anybody you ask about their first conference or their first big conference, is that it's pretty overwhelming when you don't know anybody or you know very few people. Or you might know one person and, and follow them around like a lost puppy, which is a little <laughs> awkward. But um, that the hard part is really, I think, the social part and the sort of personal part, where you feel like you're standing alone in the sea of people who all seem to know each other, <laughs> especially when you're stuck at your poster, <laughs> lonely <Yeah. laughs> and bored uh, and awkward. It's incredibly awkward. 
Um, and that's, you know, to me, is, is the thing that um, the community as a whole can, can work towards addressing, kind of just remembering our own experiences, feeling lost. And so, for example, I mean, at conferences have changed a lot in the 20 years. Uh, there's a lot more early social opportunities. There's an undergraduate mixer because some mm -hmm. undergraduates always go. There are um, often pre-conference workshops mm -hmm. where you can at least meet a few people. So if you're going to a big conference, if there's anything you can sign up for right at the beginning to help you meet a few people in a more sort of controlled environment, mm -hmm. I recommend that. There's always a, a pressure of forcing yourself to do things that you know are good for you, but are not the most socially comfortable situations to be in. And I know for me, I, I get very nervous and I have a lot of anxiety when it comes to presenting. Mm -hmm. But at these large conferences, or conferences in general, but particularly at conferences, at least if you give a presentation, it's kind of over. And then people can come and talk to you. But if you have a poster and you haven't presented anywhere else, especially at these large conferences, you are kind of lost in the sea of posters. And if you're yeah. a new graduate student uh, and you don't know anybody, or I think even if you're a postdoc or whatever and you're just doing a poster, it is really difficult to breach that space between you and your poster and the throng of people who are walking into it. And I know as a as someone who's looking at posters, it's also sometimes uncomfortable to go up and say, oh, so tell me about your work. Mm. Um, and as the poster presenter, you've either said the same thing a million times and you're kind of losing your interest, um, or you don't really know how to get people to ask you about your poster either. You have yeah. to work on your creativity with the poster and yeah. use the brilliant infographics there. Yes. This is the only yeah. way to attract people. Yeah. Yeah. That's very nice. Yeah. What brings you to posters, would you say, in, in that sort of <coughs> environment? Um, I generally sort of see myself as um, someone who's there to help people. So if I see someone standing lonely at their poster, <laughs> I will often go up and introduce myself and, and ask them. And I'm often maybe not that interested in the science, although I listen politely, but just kind of want to give them a chance to, mm. to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. And so we tend to veer off onto career objectives and what do you want to do next and that sort of thing, which is generally, I think, a bit more easy for them and for me. We sort of, there's sort of the formal time when I listen attentively and ask a few questions and then we sort of relax and have a little chat. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, But yeah, I mean, when there's 1,200 posters, <laughs> you can't really talk to all the ones who are lost, but it's great because often you see people at adjoining posters yeah. chatting. Yes. And that can be wonderful because meeting peers, and if you're in the same alley of the posters, you'll be working on something yeah. similar. Yeah, so that's yeah. true. So that works. Yeah, yeah kind you, of feeling like you're not totally on a tight leash to your posters. Yes, wandering a bit. To remember. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things I was going to mention uh, in terms of preparing for really the big conferences, but I suppose maybe to some extent the small ones, is to use Twitter. And I tend to bang the Twitter drum quite a bit, but I've seen it work well um, because every conference has a, a Twitter account usually, but also a hashtag. Mm -hmm. And the hashtag becomes active up to a year beforehand. So if you know you're going to be attending a conference and you start you know, following the hashtag, you can ask a question like, oh, what's the best hotel or something? And then other people who are attending will connect with you and you can meet people virtually ahead of the conference. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to mm -hmm. kind of break the ice and have a few people you quote know um, who you can meet up with. Many conferences have a little Twitter meetup at the beginning mm -hmm. um, so that you can meet these people you've chatted with online. And again, that's a great way to get people to your poster. You can just tweet. I'm mm -hmm. at poster 1073. Yeah, yeah. Please come see me. And yep. people do it. People yep. will drop by your poster. Take a photo yeah. of it, you know, and yeah, say, yeah. don't you want to know? Yeah. <laughs> Little teasers. Yeah, certainly there are always times where you say, oh, I can't go to this conference. I'm going to this other one, but I still want to know what yeah. happened. And that actually with ASPB, it was actually really excellent because while we weren't there, it was kind of like we got a little bit out of it just by seeing um, yeah. what was happening with, yeah. it, with, with it was, Twitter. It was the same with the new phytologist that was like last week for the yes. early career. Yes. And it was amazing. It was yeah. like, it's, it's very informative. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And 
also when someone takes the time to pull those together yeah. in a, a storify where you kind of have this permanent record because mm -hmm. it's really hard to go back and find things on yeah. Twitter. Mm -hmm. But no. if somebody puts them together and yeah. connects them by date and puts in the links and things and you have a little document, yeah. I think it really pushes the conference um, contents mm -hmm. out to the broader world. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Yeah. I think it's a really nice use of Twitter. Yeah. You're talking about <clears throat> so how that there's some undergrad graduates focused um, parts of these conferences now um, that and probably also like early careers as well as people who sit on committees now who are probably more established. Um, do you think that preparing or choosing choosing a conference and then preparing for that conference is different for each each group? Mm -hmm. But if you have the opportunity to choose, do you think a large conference is kind of a good place to start? I think everybody should go to at least one large conference, um, both, as we mentioned earlier, the breadth, but also all the other activities. And uh, ASPB, the plant biology, big plant biology meeting, as well as the botanical society and the cell biology meetings, these big conferences do a lot of, of other activities. So workshops on careers, workshop on careers in industry, workshops on publishing, workshops on mm -hmm. writing, and those experiences are really valuable. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, you're there to present and hear other people present um, and network, but if you can go and hear the editor of three journals tell you what they're looking for and how to avoid you know, mm -hmm. common errors in publishing was the workshop Mike did uh, at the Hawaii meeting. Um, that's fantastic. You don't get those opportunities elsewhere. I mean, you can always sit down and read somebody's paper. <laughs> but yeah. So I really think that those, those opportunities make the big workshops very valuable. But at the same time, I mean, we mentioned earlier, um, if you're ready to look for your postdoc and you know you want to do plant eco physiology, ecophysiology, that's not right, <laughs> electrophysiology <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, yeah, ecophysiology. Um, <laughs> that too. <laughs> um, and you can go to a Gordon conference where you're going to mm -hmm. have the, the top 20 labs or maybe the only 20 labs <laughs> doing yeah, yeah, electrophysiology. Yeah. That's brilliant because you'll, as, you, as we said, you know, you'll probably be able to give a talk. You'll certainly be able to talk to people who might be a good postdoc mentor. Sometimes meeting your potential mentors can help you make those decisions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may find that you and your person you thought you wanted to work with don't mesh very well and maybe mm -hmm. you'll choose another lab because I mean, choosing a lab on reputation alone isn't really going to give you the best fit so if you feel like you and the potential mentor can can work together that's uh, important yep. so also um you, you mentioned where your advisor lets you go and where you can get funding i mean one thing i wanted to be sure and mention is that most conferences have pools of money that you can apply to to get some travel funds and I don't think anybody covers full travel costs mm -hmm. and so it's likely you'll end up spending some money out of pocket unless mm -hmm. you happen to have a particularly good uh, independent fellowship which will sometimes cover the full costs so that limits you on where you can go geographically and <clears throat> that's one of the reasons a lot of people can't travel internationally because mm -hmm. often the funds are restricted mm -hmm. Um, but you can get travel awards from the conference, you can get travel awards from society. For example, the, um, the Company of Biologists has travel awards that they give out to people to attend any conference, mm -hmm. so it doesn't have to be linked to a particular conference. Um, eLife has uh, travel awards for early career authors who've published in their journal to, mm -hmm. to go to any conference. So, I mean, Google is great and if you know that these things exist and you can find them mm -hmm. apply to them yeah. mm -hmm. because I mean as you mentioned uh, go go for the talk go for the travel award there's nothing to lose yeah. yeah and a lot of times these travel applications are not complicated it's a page or two that you have to fill out um, I know when I was a graduate student I got an NSF travel mm -hmm. fund to go to um, a small membrane biology conference in California um, and last week I actually participated in the BBSRC postgraduate sessions uh, where we talked about external funding for travel and studying abroad. Um, I received the Lister Bell Houston Travel Fellowship last year, which sent me to a colleague's lab in Prague for a month. Um, there was a postgraduate 
who spent three months at the university, no, Georgia Tech, I think, in Atlanta. Um, and he actually did just a Google search and he brought up a bunch of travel grants that you can apply for. And certainly I know the University of Glasgow has a bunch mm -hmm. of travel grants. Um, and I think some institutes or departments have particular boosts as well. So they might match a small mm -hmm. fund that you get. Oh, no, I completely agree. Um, and when you look at a CV and you see that they've gotten little travel awards and things like that, it exactly what you said. It shows that somebody else decided yeah. they were fun. So then when they're applying to you for money, you say, oh, well, look, these people, yeah. <laughs> I'll just go along with them. Yeah. <laughs> right? It really gives you this sense of um, confidence in the applicant. And it doesn't mean that the applicant's better than somebody who's not applying. It just means that they've taken the time to apply. And it makes a big difference when you're evaluating people who maybe have the same number of papers, same similar CV, but one of them has been, you know, making the effort to try and, and solicit funding and getting being successful, that's going to make the huge difference. And I think, I think it's ASPB, uh, but I'm sure there are other conferences as well, that if you volunteer, you get some that's right. discount on travel or accommodation or something, too? It, yep, yep. I think, I can't remember exactly how they do it, but, and I think even a conference, if they're not promoting that, it's worth, if, if you Ask. want to attend, it's mm -hmm. worth asking, and yep. they can probably find yeah. a way to help yep. you. And There's a bit of leeway. I guess one of the key messages is plan ahead, and, you know, a year ahead, you should be thinking about what conferences you want to attend, because they all have their dates and places yep. and announcements, and you're going to want to arrange travel Travel time, arrange funding, mm -hmm. arrange all mm -hmm. the logistical mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you mentioned something about the people who organize the conference being scientists, and, and I, I wanted to fit this in somewhere, and this is probably as good as anywhere else, is I mean, we, we've been talking about Gordon conferences and plant biology conferences and cell biology conferences, and there are certain conferences that are sort of well-known and have been around for a long time. But recently there's another type of conference which is – typically described as a predatory conference. And unfortunately, these conferences can look somewhat legitimate. Um, and they'll have a conference website, and they can email you and invite you to come speak. And unfortunately, people are, are being lured into attending a conference that's, in many ways, an illegitimate conference. Because sometimes they use uh, famous names to as, as pretending like the people are involved and they're, they're really not. Um, and often they may claim that certain big shot scientists are speaking when in fact those big shot scientists have no intention or no knowledge of this conference. Mm -hmm. And so there was just an article in the paper the other day about someone who was suing the government um, of a country that had hosted one of these conferences for, um, I can't remember what the exact legal problem was, but she had spent a lot of money to travel, and it turned out that it was mostly an empty room with a few um, duped scientists walking around, really having been um, ripped off. So if you Google predatory conferences, you can find articles in Science and the New York Times. So just as a caveat, don't, you, if, you, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. <laughs> We were talking about kind of preparing that, that preparing for a conference, knowing which conference. You want to do your research on which conference might be best for you under your current circumstances or what your future goals are. Um, you might want to ask yourself if you want to go to a large conference or a small conference, what kind of things. And we kind of talked about what kind of things are good about both of them. What other kind of things should we do before we decide to to register for a conference? Um, well, visas. So if you're a scientist who's, well, generally, I think if you're a, an EU or a US passport holder, it's frequently not an issue, but there still are some countries that you need to get a visa ahead of time. But certainly, if you're a Chinese scientist, um, even if you're working in Europe, you might need to mm -hmm. get a visa to travel to the US or something. So it, it, re it refers to your passport. And unfortunately, visa issues, you know, the, the conference has no control over these things. So they'll advise you to apply for a visa early. But I mean, the last two conferences I went to, there was a, a spot where the speaker had not been able to get their, mm. their visa in time and mm. didn't appear, which is it's a really sad thing. But that is something to consider.
Um, well, and, and another point which I wanted to mention is that we've really been focusing on, on research conferences. Um, and there are some other conferences that you might consider. Um, there are some conferences that have a focus on sort of science education or science mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. And you might want to go to one of these if you're thinking of making communication or education part of your um, part of your career and they tend to be a bit smaller. Um, I know the American Society of Microbiology just had their undergraduate education uh, conference and I was reading the tweets from that. The Society for Experimental Biology has an education symposium um, every other year and it brings together people who are uh, teaching in higher education across the sciences um, and they're great meetings. They're small but it's a wonderful opportunity to meet people who are passionate about good teaching. Um, and then again, there are some small conference slash workshop type things, like you know, on si topics of science communication. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, they they tend to be small and re relatively inexpensive. But you know, you might want to consider those as well when you're looking at conference opportunities. So one of the things that I remember about the larger conferences is that there are a lot of stalls too. So there's mm -hmm. uh, different publishers, there's different uh, vendors of many different different things. How should students approach these places? Because right. certainly um, students and postdocs don't necessarily have like buying yep. power, so yeah. it's not like we're going to go get a subscription to some new journal right. or we're not going to be able to buy yep. new material. We kind of go there for the candy. Yep, I think, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Free well, pens. Yeah, Free pens. pens. But how, exactly. how can we, so the, the talks are really kind of the yep. premier mm. component of um, of these conferences, but how do we deal with the vendors? Right. Now that's a good question. Um, I mean, I've actually had stalls at various events. <laughs> um, I've represented the ASPB Education Committee at the Federation of European Societies of Plant Biology, and I represented the uh, plant Cell Journal and Plant Physiology Journal at the Photosynthesis Congress. So I can tell you what it's like to be a <laughs> an, an exhibitor. Um, so first of all, be nice to the exhibitors because they pay ridiculously huge fees. I mean, literally thousands of dollars for a, a, a few you know cubic meters of space. Um, and that is one of the, the exhibitors really help keep the cost down. So mm -hmm. kind of you know recognize that they're not there to, to parasitize on you, but they're mm -hmm. actually supporting yeah, the conference. Definitely. And as a sort of bonus, they get a little bit of space. So um, some of the people there are very much um, there to make sales. So some of the equipment people, you know, have sales targets they have to meet. And, uh, you know, so obviously if you're not going to buy an HPLC, you, you know, you can still drop by and say hello and yeah. ask them if they're enjoying Barcelona or wherever <laughs> you are. Um, and, you know, treat them like human beings is very nice. <laughs> Uh, they do always have great freebies, and most exhibitors don't necessarily want to take the freebies back. I mean, they may, but in, and often, it, you know, they just consider it one-way shipping. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's okay to ask, you know, for a pen. That's yeah. what they're there for, right? Yeah. Be nice, be polite. But the other thing I wanted to say is that you would be surprised by how many of the people in these exhibitor stands actually have PhDs in science. And... I mean, I think sometimes we think that they probably come from a business background or something, but it's not an uncommon career direction to take to go to a company that sells equipment mm -hmm. or journals mm -hmm. or professional societies or something like that. So if you're at all thinking about a career outside of academia, I recommend going around and just asking people, you know, oh, what's it like to work for Conviron? What's it, mm -hmm. uh, how did you get your position? Do mm -hmm. you hire PhDs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you might find that um, you know, there's an opportunity that you weren't aware of there. Mm -hmm. And true. just to put in a plug for the Journal of Experimental Botany, um, they put together hard copies of special issues or collections. So and uh, they'll put out, I think they do six a year or so, and if you go by their stand, you can pick up the, the, the past two years most recent papers on electrophysiology mm. or photosynthesis or whatever yes. and those are quite nice if you find mm. the one that's on the topic you're, you're, you're yeah, keen yeah. on yeah. keeping yeah. up on. A lot of the handling of a manuscript uh, in a journal is done by the professional staff as opposed to by the professors who run the editorial board mm. so mm -hmm. if you have a if you go to the publishers and chat with people they may be the person who's the first person to get your paper and if you've forgotten to insert a figure or something they may or may not gently remind you yeah. so 
doesn't hurt to make those connections as mm-hmm. well. So I'll be attending a conference in September. And I know that when I applied a couple of months ago, you you have to write an abstract and submit it and everything. And um, my rule is always I want two pieces of data in my hand mm-hmm. that I know I can have mm-hmm. and I can make <laughs> the, uh, an inference that I might have the mm-hmm. last mm-hmm. three pieces mm-hmm. that will mm-hmm. put together all of my slides. But I'm always struggling a little bit with like putting yourself through, through that, <laughs> you know, of saying how much data do I need to feel confident that I can give a good presentation or have a good poster? Mm, yeah. mm-hmm. How do you guys deal with with just dis- making a decision of, of what you can bring to a, to a conference? Well, that, that's, a, that's a pretty deep question. <laughs> um, I think it's really important for graduate students and postdocs to give talks, and I think most people do. And that's why most conferences have a blend of these hotshot you know, people who basically tell you about their publications, right? I mean, most of the keynote or plenary speakers don't have much preliminary data, and they're great talks, but you're not learning what's unpublished. Whereas for graduate students and postdocs, their work more often includes unpublished work, because it's often more of a progress report than a complete story. But we all recognize that it's invaluable for people to have that opportunity, not only to develop their writing and speaking skills and get feedback on a work in progress. So I think that maybe you have a feeling of a little too much pressure, because um, I think if your abstract is submitted, then the topic is interesting. And I think the worst thing you can do really is, is oversell Hmm. in the abstract or in the talk. I mean, it's not uncommon that people don't read the abstracts, right? I mean, I rarely read the abstracts, especially now that they're all on a flash drive instead of in my book. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, the abstract probably is written for the, the program committee that's selecting things as much as anything. So you don't necessarily want to overpromise. So I think once you're preparing your talk, um, you're making a story and being honest about mm-hmm. what's worked and what hasn't, because that can be as interesting as anything. Yeah. If you say, well, and when I crossed these two mutants, I saw no effect whatsoever, you know, that's still an observation that's in, you know, it may be disappointing, but it's still a, a meaningful yeah. piece of information. Yeah. And there's no harm in showing the work that you've done that didn't lead to, I mean, if, if you have a, a smudgy, smeary Western blot, you won't show it, but if it's, it's valuable, insightful data yeah. that your hypothesis is incorrect, then that's still valuable. Mm-hmm. So I think you probably have plenty to say. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in 10 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> right. And the you know the first bit does have to be the sort of background, yeah. right? Because I think we often uh, expect our audience to know a lot more than they do, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. people go to talks to learn things, not just to see the very mm-hmm. last slide. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of people who like like I did. The first two slides are the most meaningful, and the rest of it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember thinking, what is alternative oxidase? <laughs> never heard of it before <laughs> but um yeah so I think you have to consider that your audience is very diverse and and some people will only get the beginning and some people are waiting you know patiently for what's the latest <laughs> yeah. finding you brought up two things Mary that I thought was really interesting one um one is when you decide to present data that is not published mm-hmm. especially at a large mm-hmm. conference mm-hmm. um and um, one of the things that I know that um, big conferences, but maybe conferences in general, try to really clamp down on is taking pictures of people's posters or taking pictures during people's presentations mm. because data may not be yeah. published yet and yeah. or not ready for for larger um, a larger audience. Um, how do you feel like that is really managed at a large conference like ASPB? I guess it's like so much of science where we can kind of hope for the honor system, but Mm. the honor system is fallible, unfortunately. And I agree. I mean, it's considered rude to take a picture of someone's poster unless, you know, you're given permission. Um, And in talks as well, um, if someone, and I think this is a good piece of advice where if you're not ready to have your work shared broadly, you need to be clear about it because we know people are tweeting during talks and, 
different conferences have different uh, policies. Mm -hmm. And I think right now the conferences that discourage live tweeting are the minority. But there are still some conferences that don't want people tweeting during talks, whereas I think most conferences are happy to have mm -hmm. the science disseminated more broadly. But for example, let's say you're at the ASPB meeting where they encourage people to tweet during talks and you really don't want some data shared. Well, first of all, why are you sharing it <laughs> in the conference, right? Because you don't know who's in the audience. Um, and second of all, it's okay if you really don't want this share just to say, you know, okay, this is unpublished data. I don't want it to leave this room. Um, you know, it doesn't require a photograph for the information to leave the room. Um, but you can put a little picture of the t Twitter bird with an X through it, you know, to kind yeah. of remind people that you, they shouldn't be sharing it. But I think that question of why, why don't you want anybody out of the room to see your data or out of the poster hall to see your data or your findings is a really interesting question. I mean, because now we live in the age of preprints and mm. most people accept that preprints are, you know, uh, an early version of a paper kind mm -hmm. of like a poster is, mm -hmm. right? And so many people are happily putting up their almost ready to submit or newly submitted paper in a preprint, hoping to get feedback, just like we do posters, except mm -hmm. now it's happening you know, around the world. Um, and I think there are still some people who, who find that deeply troubling, and they don't want anyone to know about their work until it's accepted for publication. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a generational thing, because when I was a student, um, we really didn't know much about what was going on in other people's labs. We didn't have the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so whenever someone went to a conference, they would come back and fill us in on what all of our mm -hmm. sort of competitors, you know, if you use yeah, that term loosely, were doing. And, you know, oh, so-and-so cloned this, or so-and-so, you know, is, is doing that. It was really hot news, because we mm -hmm. just didn't know. I mean, it's almost like the days of the wireless, right? Yeah, you didn't know what was going on fine. in the world. So... Um, and I don't think anybody, well, we didn't have cell phones back then, but, you know, I don't think people really generally took pictures of things. I mean, that's, that's kind of a technology thing. Um, but now I, I just feel like there's, things are so much more porous and fluid that it's, it's a little bit maybe slightly paranoid to feel that you can't discuss or share. I realize for industry it might be different, but I think for academic scientists, I think generally, um, it's probably an unfounded worry to worry too much about whether mm -hmm. someone's going to take mm -hmm. a picture of your poster. Mm -hmm. But however, we do need to uh, adhere to the conference rules. As audience members, we kind of need to be sensitive to that, perhaps, you know, just in terms of etiquette. Um, but I, I am interested in the in the new dichotomy, dichotomy now of um, information being available anywhere. And, you know, we, we talked about predatory conferences and this ability for things to get kind of lost in what is real and mm -hmm. what isn't, mm -hmm. who can take advantage of you and who won't. And then um, as we start utilizing our tools more, like with Twitter, with open access or open resource, with preprints, people really just putting stuff out there. There seems to be this renaissance of, of like academic community mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. I find really invigorating and I really hope that it does get rid of some of our um, pessimistic attitudes mm -hmm. of kind of being fooled once mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. um, so I'm really interested yeah I'm really interested to see how how that progresses you know do we become more of a community and less of competitor and less com competing or less competitive um, yeah. or not yeah or is it it's always difficult when you your work and your research depends on money to get away from the competitiveness. You know, unfortunately, you might have to. Let's say we have similar idea and we have to go for the same fund. You know, so you cannot. Basically, it's a competition there. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. I mean, hard. yeah. You're you're a brilliant idea that you're just so happy you thought of, but you mm. have no data to support it. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't put that forward in any form until yeah. you were ready to put it in as a grant. But, you know, grant proposals are confidential. And yeah. You can't review a grant and then go tell someone yeah, about yeah, this course. brilliant idea, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're, the time to make it public is when 
you know, you have evidence for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think you have to be a bit careful about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think that I had always thought about it as, you know, uh, does this complete the story that I'm trying to tell? Mm -hmm. um, I hadn't really thought about, well, if I don't want anyone to talk about it, why am I talking about it? <laughs> yeah. I think that that's actually yeah. a really good question to ask yourself. Um, you know, here's, this is my idea for my presentation. Is all of this stuff what I feel comfortable having 200 mm -hmm. eyeballs mm -hmm. looking at? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a great, that's a great thing to, to think about particularly now with immediate sharing mm -hmm. Yet again, for usually these decisions come from the group leaders, whether mm -hmm. these data are presented or no. But it's very important for the students to have the experience because I know from my some of my colleagues that didn't have the opportunity to go to a conference as students because the supervisor didn't want to... Um, present the data. Mm. Basically, they miss the opportunity to network or communicate or even learn how to present and outreach their science. So we have, I mean, that goes for the group leaders. It's, it's important yeah. people have this experience. Yeah. yeah. I mean, PhDs and postdoc can be quite short. And if you don't have your paper published or submitted, yeah. You know, through, for the yeah. bulk of the time you're yeah. there, you, you shouldn't be blocked from going yeah, to conferences exactly. and presenting something. Exactly. Um, so I think you know, if you have a, a, a few really nice figures that you can turn into a poster, yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, it's a shame. I know that there are some group leaders who don't like that, yeah. but I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, ASPB has a, an inexpensive conference, which is the regional conferences. Mm -hmm. So the... Um, the western section and the northeastern section, and those are much cheaper than the national, both mm -hmm. in terms of registration and in terms of travel, obviously, mm -hmm. because you're going somewhere by car often. And they have a lot of, you know, it's really kind of designed to have give students and postdocs mm -hmm. the opportunity. So many people, maybe in their first or second year, can go to a smaller regional mm -hmm. conference and then kind of when they're ready to publish or have yep. their paper done or something, or ready to look for their postdoc, they can yeah, go to the yeah. bigger stage. Yeah. But I think that's nice, too, to yeah. have these yeah. these tiered conferences in a way. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's also a social component, obviously, not just a professional component to these. That's why they probably put them in such nice places really <laughs> makes you want to go to the yeah. conferences um, and the conferences are usually not that long maybe four or five mm -hmm. days at yeah. most um, and some of them can be really jam-packed I know the cell wall meetings that I had gone to oh man like we started at nine we went till seven you yeah know? Um, some of them have uh, lunches or dinners included some mm -hmm. of them don't mm -hmm. um, I think that the ones that have lunch included are really nice because you really actually do get to meet Yep. people on a more social, yeah. personal level. Yeah. Um, conferences oftentimes have little outings. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I think that, um, you know, you choose a place or, I know we went to, what was it? I think it was one of the cell wall meetings was in Porto, Portugal. Wow. And they were really trying to encourage people to come to Portugal. Mm -hmm. um, so they took us on so many different little jaunts out onto the city and there was a wonderful walking tour and we did a whole bunch of stuff and you know they had like two full days that were just like slammed full of it was also a small meeting but it was just two days of, of straight conference and then I think the other three days were kind of half days hmm. and they gave us opportunities mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. go on boat trips and really experience the city and I was very appreciative of that as yeah. someone um, you know I, I wasn't necessarily super well traveled you are in this beautiful place in the middle of the summertime, mm -hmm. if you're stuck in a conference hall for those five days, mm -hmm. looking yeah. outside, mm -hmm. wishing that you could be near the sea, and you never get the opportunity to do it, I think that it's one of the best things for a conference to do is to give you some opportunity to explore the place that you're in. Um, I think you'll remember the conference in another year, maybe you would go. Um, but I think that having that social yeah. space is really important, too, just to get your get a little distance from all of the work you've been doing, but also be able to have time to think about the work and, like you said, to see who these people really are. If you're thinking about, is this someone I might want to collaborate with? Is this someone I might mm -hmm. want to postdoc or mm -hmm. a, um, a career with? Because certainly I think we all put on our professional 
masks sometimes and it's good to see yeah. how people are as human beings too yeah. not just yeah. as science scientists um, I think that those those are really important yeah no I, I like the ones where the lunch is included or even the lunch and dinner and obviously it makes it more expensive and that's kind of the trade-off mm -hmm. is you know is the conference registration a thousand dollars but your meals are included when reality is you might be able to not three three hundred dollars off the registration and not include meals and you can certainly feed yourself for five days on less than three hundred dollars right mm -hmm. so it's great to be able to just sit down at a table and start mm -hmm. talking to people who are at yeah. the conference and uh, it sometimes has a financial cost so it's always a difficult one um, but as far as the outings absolutely I mean I'm not really a, a kind of organized tour person myself but I have done it when the conferences have been in you know strange places and you only have half a day yeah. right and yeah. I've always really enjoyed them because hey you're on the bus with people from the conference right so yes. and you get to do things kind of really efficiently yes. <laughs> yeah 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 you just kind of follow the leader yeah, yeah. so those are very good yeah. actually one last thing um, I think we're probably running out of time but I, I had a, a practice issue I wanted to bring up as something to consider when you're planning for a conference. Um, one of them is accommodation. So, mm. I mean, if you go to a Gordon conference, you get to stay in those marvelous um, posh boarding schools <laughs> and the lake and the hills, and it's really nice. But if you're in a big city, you know, you have there might be a hotel associated with it or several hotels, mm -hmm. and sometimes there's a sort of four star, three star, two star, star and dorm mm -hmm. option. Um, and safety. Um, so I've gone to a lot of conferences. I usually go on my own and I usually try to get the closest hotel to the conference center okay. and that's purely, it's, it's not because I'm lazy, it's purely because of a safety thing because mm -hmm. I don't feel comfortable in a big city, you know, walking yeah. four or five blocks. I did that at one city which will not be named and yeah. I stayed in the cheapest hotel which was a mile or so from the conference center and going home you know from the conference center at night alone it was really uncomfortable yeah. Yeah. and yeah. you might hang around and hope somebody's walking your way but that's mm -hmm. not always feasible especially yeah. if you go to an evening workshop. And yeah. If you are an international if you're international in that space where you may not know the language very well um, or otherwise be disoriented, it's probably really useful to keep these things in mind. Yeah. 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 So if Seven. you can if you can travel with someone or there's roommate services, but again, you don't really know who you're gonna end up with mm -hmm. as a roommate. But I mean ideally if you're uncomfortable and you have someone else that you can share a room with, mm -hmm. at least that gives you a sort of buddy for walking yeah. back and forth. I mean most conferences are reasonably safe, but it is just something to be aware of. More and more people are now using um, Airbnbs, yes. um, mm -hmm. and that's great if you can get a group of people, you know, to share a space. Yeah. And again, you kind of got your home that you can walk to back and forth. That's nice. But um, and an issue. This issue came up with a conference that someone pointed out. Um, now, now I think we're we're very aware when you look at a conference website about the the gender distribution of mm -hmm. the keynote and plenary speakers, and so. It's very common now, where you, especially in plant sciences, where we do have an awful lot of, of women PIs, which is brilliant. Um, but you know, usually you see roughly equal numbers of men and women on the, the big glossy page, mm -hmm. web page with all the, the portraits. But someone pointed out there was a conference where I think less than ten, fewer than ten percent, less than ten percent of the speakers were women, um, and it didn't make sense but we did wonder if maybe it was it was in a, an international location that isn't necessarily considered yeah. hugely safe mm -hmm. and it we just wondered if it were possible that people had been invited to speak and had turned it down so again you know it's fun to go to exotic places but there are some places maybe where you really do want to be sure you have yeah someone with you yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. or yeah that it's a place that you're going to feel comfortable in um, or if because of those decisions that even the conference space is going to be one that you're mm -hmm. going to feel comfortable in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And not just from a gender, but maybe from a, you know, race, racial perspective too. I mean, I think we, there's a lot of popularity to talk, well, not popularity because it's, it's true that there aren't very many women, um, that distributed in, in science, science areas generally particularly at higher mm -hmm. higher levels so yeah conference speakers keynote speakers not very many of them are women but how many of them are people of color mm -hmm. you know so if you go to a conference do you have a good distribution of um of any of any type of minority yeah. 
um, and how is that going to affect their feeling of safety, feeling of comfort, level, you know, just level of identity, mm -hmm. yep. Um, yep. representation in, in general. And, um, and again, I think these are conversations that didn't happen much when I was a student, and now they're very important. And yeah. that's one of the first things people look at when they look at a conference website. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. does this look proportional? Does it look yeah. uh, diverse? I mean, am I seeing myself on that poster? And yes, change is slow. We, we all know there's a million reasons why, you know, white men still dominate the higher levels of, um, of science, but we're also aware that there's things that we individually and collectively can do to try and mm -hmm. move things to a more proportional representation. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's very important. Yeah. Um, sometimes you run into people who, who argue that culture has no effect on achievement, and you just think, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I think uh, we are ready to wrap up, Yeah. maybe? How should uh, should we talk about before? Um, well, the only other thing I think that I wrote down was um, in terms of preparing. Um, just we talked about preparing your poster and preparing your um, your talk, mm -hmm. but also preparing your sort of informal talk, your your elevator pitch or something. Mm, so important, yeah. sometimes I'll introduce myself to someone and they'll launch into their twenty minute poster talk, yeah. and, and I'm just on the escalator, you know. <laughs> yeah. So. It's good to be able to say something about yourself and your interests in, in a minute or, or so. Yeah, I remember, I don't remember where I heard it, but I, I definitely did not make it up myself, but I don't know where to give credit to, is that I think it was more in the perspective of um, how do you talk to non-scientists when they say, so what do you do? That you have your like one sentence thing, mm. and then if they are a little more interested, you have like your thirty second thing, mm. and then if they really seem to be interested, then you have your five minute mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's kind of it's you know oh so what do you do oh I'm a plant scientist or I'm a cell biologist oh cool what do you study well <laughs> so yeah kind of being able to read the mm -hmm. room mm -hmm. is a good is a good thing but yeah that's a great that's a great thing to remember is um, people may not come to your poster. Uh, mm -hmm. But you may be standing in line at lunch. Yes, yes, yes. Um, yes and absolutely. you might turn. They might turn around and say hello and look at your name tag and say, "Oh, I know your advisor." Exactly. You know, or yep. Something like that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and asking the other person as well. I mean, yeah, it has to be two way. Mutual. So yeah. if, if 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 Maria approaches you, you should reciprocate. Of <laughs> and what do you do? Yeah. <laughs> Don't leave the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And a Asian students, if I had the opportunity to speak to Asian students, I would strongly encourage them to be a bit more open to these mm -hmm. small talks because it's yeah. very difficult. And I, many people have said it's because, you know, in the academic culture in Asia, you don't speak to someone who's above you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, but it, it can be quite difficult to try and Actually, that's break not the only ice. in Asia, it's also in Europe. Yeah. Like lots of uh, uh, European countries, they have this. Elitist, yeah, uh, hierarchy. Yeah, which is yeah. awkward, isn't it? it? Totally. Yeah. Totally. It's like. Uh, and yeah. and it it's up to the people who uh, have the power to um, break down those yeah, walls. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I, I know um, Maria and I talk a lot about also feeling comfortable speaking. You know, if English isn't your first language, yes. your accent. You know, you might feel uncomfortable with, but um, as as someone who only speaks English and doesn't have the um, the benefit of being a multilingual person, um, I of course do as much as I can to communicate and make feel, someone feel comfortable and don't care about someone's accent. And that really kind of brings us back to what we started with was this idea of taking advantage of the conference to really talk to people yeah. and network. And it's incredibly difficult. And, you know, I've been to, I've been to, dozens of conferences and there's always someone I know and I it's so easy now because it's easy for me to find someone I can talk to but I totally remember that first conference mm, and the, yeah. the agony of not knowing how to speak to people but you have to do it and yeah. it's yeah. I mean I don't know if there's any secrets other than just be brave and and yeah. go up and talk and to people everybody has been through as you exactly. say you know you were there and now you know and you have you remember how it was so I'm pretty sure that people will appreciate yeah. your effort and they will talk to you, you know. I mean, 
we have the common experience, you know, yeah. from and where we started. Yeah, it's a skill set, just like anything else, like being able to give a good presentation, being able to ace an exam, all yeah. of these things take practice, and yeah. going and trying to feel confident and comfortable at a conference, it also takes practice. Yes. Yeah. At least to look like you're confident and comfortable. Anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you're right, though. It is. A, it, maybe that's a good way to think about it. it. It's a skill just like presenting your work. Yeah. You know, being able to socialize yeah. in a yeah. professional setting yeah. and step outside your comfort zone, that's a skill that will help you mm -hmm. achieve your goals, right? Yeah. If you yeah, can sure. make these connections at every conference you go to, then the next conference is a million times easier. And to us again and telling us about conferences, I think it's really good to get ideas about how best to make use of these kind of weird environments that are mm -hmm. common but unique to our situations at times. And we can start planning the next conference. That's right. Yeah. As you said, you we have to be prepared yeah, in advance. So now for, for next yeah. summer. Yeah, where That's is right. the ASPB going to be next? Montreal. Year? Oh, Canada. nice. Yeah. yeah. And the uh, Arabidopsis meetings in Turku, Finland, oh, which is very good. The nice. SEB meeting, the Society for Experimental Biology, is in uh, Venice. Venice or Florence? No, Florence, I think. Yeah, Florence. And Either the, would do. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then the International yeah. Society of Plant Molecular Biology, ISPMB, is in Montpellier, France. Oh, so it's going to nice. be a very European summer. Yeah, uh, yeah it's going to be fun. Looks good. <laughs> Excellent. There's a, there's a trafficking Gordon conference next year in New Hampshire. Mm. Oh, but those Gordon conferences are so nice. Yeah. Something about summer in New England yeah. in a camp, basically. Yeah, it's not, it's not bad. It's not bad. So things to keep on our radar. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Thanks. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thanks for listening to our recent podcast. Please stay tuned for our future our future podcasts by um, following the Institute for Molecular Cell and Systems Biology at the University of Glasgow. You can follow Mary on Twitter at Plant Teaching. You can follow Maria at M underscore Papanatsu. And you can follow me, Emily Larson, at ER Larson underscore PhD. And our um, other co-host, Emily Armstrong, you can follow her on Twitter at Emily X Armstrong. Stay tuned for next time.